Well, this morning we're going to dive back into the topic that we started last week, which was um, enjoy, uh, helping our children to understand assurance. Um, how do we enjoy assurance? And um, the question, of course, is a much different question, a much different issue than giving children assurance. This is an issue of understanding assurance. And so I want to remember, remind you that it's incredibly important as we think about this, just as, as, especially as parents, it's incredibly important that we remember that we don't give our children assurance. We help them to understand assurance. And of course, the difference would be when we help, help someone else understand assurance, we're pointing them to the scriptures. We're pointing them to what God says is true of a Christian. And so, you know, when, when your child comes to you and says, hey, dad, you know, do you think I'm saved? You know, that doesn't really matter. Uh, the, you know, what's, what matters is, hey, you know what's, what's important, son, is what does the scripture say is true of a believer? Let's go to God's word, and then you can know um, whether you're saved. You can know, is your faith real? Is, is your faith uh, from God? And so that's incredibly important, and that's why I tried to title it in a way that would um, distance us from the idea of giving assurance. Instead, we're just helping our children understand assurance. And so... The reason why that's so important, as we saw last week, was the fallibility of conscience. Um, uh, the fallibility of my own conscience. First of all, assurance is something that God gives directly to an individual through his word. So uh, that's, that's someone else's assurance is between them and the Lord. <laughs> and my assurance is between me and the Lord. And even if I limited assurance to myself, my conscience is still fallible. And so we saw that in 1 John 3, and you can go back and listen to that or or go back and read verses 19 and 20. Especially, you know, the Apostle John is just so helpful there because he points out that there are times when our conscience will actually indict us, and it will indict us at times unfairly. And and, And he even says, God is greater than our hearts. So where do you get assurance when your heart indicts you? Could your heart be right? It certainly could be. And so he goes outside of my own conscience, outside of my own heart, to look at objective tests of a living faith to see, am I really in Christ? And so that's what's so helpful, that's what's so pastoral about that passage in 1 John 3. The way that you would quiet a heart that's condemning you falsely is you go back to objective tests like love for the brethren, which is one of the great tests, and we'll look at that this morning. Um, Do you love Christians? And um, so that's how John is thinking that through, because there are times where a true Christian's conscience can start bearing down on him and say, are you kidding me? You think that you're on good terms with God? And you've got to ask the question, am I on good terms with God? If I silence it without biblical warrant, I could do damage to my conscience. Or if I listen to an indicting conscience without warrant, I can live miserably without assurance. And God wants us to have assurance, and so... That's why we spent some time looking at what the scriptures say about how do we actually enjoy assurance of salvation. What are the true grounds of assurance? What are the true evidences and the true marks of a Christian? And so if you remember, we also talked about there's a lot of things that we could look at uh, that would be true of Christians that are also true of non-Christians. And so, you know, in our little dog illustration, I mean, there's a lot of qualities of a dog that can also describe a table and a, uh, and, and a chair and a guinea pig and everything else. And so the question really becomes, what, it's not just what's true of Christians, but what's true of Christians that's not true of non-Christians? That's what we're looking for in Scripture. And so when we see something that's actually exclusive of Christians— being produced in our life by the power of the Holy Spirit, wow, man, our kids can have such insurance, we have such assurance, because we're seeing something that we couldn't do. When I see something in my life that I know Jonathan Anderson could not replicate, how humbling is that to say, wow, that's way beyond John Anderson's pay grade, that's way beyond his ability, that's so sweet to see the Lord producing something in my life that that he alone produces. Um, that's where assurance comes from. And so last week, we, um, we looked at the first mark, the first ground, I should say, of enjoying assurance, which is killing sin. Only true believers can actually put sin to death. Unbelievers can change behaviors. Unbelievers can adopt 
one idol and exchange it for another idol. Unbelievers can um, continue in their enslavement to sin and it could take on a new form. And so certain behaviors in an unbeliever's life might fall by the wayside. One might go from certain habits or of, of um, lifestyle, and because idols change, they adopt a new habit of lifestyle because that now becomes self-serving. But that's not killing sin. That's still being enslaved to the same old idol of self. Only Christians, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can actually be in a process where we are putting to death the deeds of the flesh. And so we looked at um, Romans 8, 12 to 17, and then I also mentioned Colossians 3, verses 5 and 6. Those are really helpful passages that might be um, helpful if you're walking through a a child or a teenager, just thinking that through, what does it actually look like? And um, so we talked about that, not, not, certainly not at great length, but hopefully that was clarifying, just looking at what that looks like. It's not an issue of sin has already been put to death, past tense. It's presently being put to death, and it's being done so by the power of the Holy Spirit, by means of the Holy Spirit, through his influence as we come under his word. Now, this morning what I want to do is we're going to look at the next several grounds of assurance, and these are going to go a little bit quicker. Um, I want to try to get through try to get through all four of these, and, um, and then at the end, just trying to give some en- encouragement for parents, practical exhortations for how we can talk about this with our, with, our, with our kids. So number one, last week was killing sin. Number two, we're going to pick it back up here, and number two is hungering for the word. Hungering for the word. And I want to turn your attention to um, that great text, 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. And so just grab your Bibles, open up to 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3. That's where we're going to park here for a moment. Peter is, is describing what ought to be true of anyone who has experienced the kindness of the Lord and his goodness in salvation. And... Um, it's very important. I think I like to read verses 1 through 3 uh, in line with 22 to 25. Obviously, it's in, in the context of the whole epistle. Uh, but at least, let's go back to chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. And I'm going to read this because that helps us understand the connection to hungering for the word. Because it's in a context where Peter's talking about a child of God who has been born again by the power of the word. And so when that's the context, it makes a lot of sense why this becomes a mark or a ground of assurance. What's true of somebody who's, who has, should have assurance would be that there is an appetite for the word. And we'll talk about what that looks like, because practically it's easier to say that than to describe what that actually is in, in practice. So let's pick it up in verses, verses 22 to 25 of chapter 1. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Notice the word of God here is an imperishable seed. And it's pictured as this imperishable seed that becomes planted and then regenerates life in a spiritually dead soul. And so he talks about how temporal and passing man is and how eternal and abiding the word of God is. It endures forever. And it has the, it's the only thing that has the power to cause spiritual life. The Word of God gives life where there isn't life and sustains life. It's the only cause of spiritual life, and it's the only agent that sustains spiritual life. The enduring Word of God. This is powerful. Now keep that in mind as we dive into chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And Peter takes that truth that we just read about the life-giving quality of the Word of God And now he's going to make some connections to what that's going to look like in the life of somebody who's spiritually alive. And this becomes helpful as we think about our own assurance or if we're helping our children understand assurance. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, 
Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Okay, let me just quickly kind of walk through this passage very, very fast here. A couple of grammatical observations. First of all, verse 1 is a participle. Just putting aside all malice. It says, you can, you can, if you read that, you might not know what a participle is, but when you read that, you know it's kind of hanging in the balance. You're, you're waiting for uh, something to finish this thought. So therefore, putting aside all malice. And if I just stop talking, you're like, yeah, what? Like, where's that going? And where it's going is in verse 2. It's the command, long for the pure milk of the word. So this putting aside malice is telling us something about how you long for the pure milk of the word. You could even translate it this way. Therefore, by putting aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all, and all slander, long. It's actually the means, it's, it's the means by which we would actually long for the word. This becomes incredibly important when we see a lack of appetite. Why would there be a potential lack of appetite in someone's life? Well, one option is they're not a believer. Another option is just that you might not be putting off sin as described in verse 1. Because even a believer can, will see, no doubt will see, waxing and waning, rising and falling, seasons of appetite. And it's helpful to start in verse 1 and recognize that Peter's telling us how to get after this longing, this, this appetite, this craving for the Word of God. And part of the process is by putting aside all of these things. Mark it down. If I'm holding on to sin in my heart, the last thing I'm going to have an appetite for is the very source of life that is so brilliant and blazingly bright with the glory of God that if it shines on my heart, it's going to expose something I'm hanging on to. So if I'm hanging on to some sort of sin, I'm not wanting to get rid of, not wanting to get exposed, not wanting to get rid of it, well, then I'm going to be stiff-arming the Word of God and saying, I don't know. I don't know if I want that. And so all of a sudden, my appetite for the Word of God starts to plummet because it starts to, it starts, something I'm hanging on to is getting threatened. And so Peter is pointing out how critical it is that all these things are going to be put aside. The first two have the adjective all, and the fifth one has the adjective all. Numbers 3 and 4, hypocrisy and envy, don't have the word all. Seems like what Peter's saying here is that malice and deceit and slander are acts that we would perform and so put off every action uh, pertaining to those qualities, whereas hypocrisy and envy seem to be more descriptive of kind of a characteristic. And so that seems to be the difference there. All of that needs to be put off. And then he compares this appetite to a newborn baby. A newborn baby is, doesn't have a lot of ability. But one thing it has a lot of ability, one area where it succeeds quite well, is letting you know when it's hungry. And um, that's not something that, uh, you know, at least in our household, that um, you really outgrow either. <laughs> I, remember, um, I remember one of our boys, you know, even being almost, almost to, like just right up to the, uh, the ver you know, being, becoming verbal. You know, I remember sitting him in his high chair, and um, it's like once he's in the high chair, he knows it's game time. And if, if the food is, is, is slow in coming from the kitchen and his tray is still empty... I mean, he would just, bam, and just, wah, wah, and start pumping his fist. And he's just like anticipating like this event. He just could not wait for this event to happen. And you're just like, okay, this kid does not need to be in his high chair until we are like, until food is on the table. This is going to be, this is not going to go well. Um, this is an incredible hunger, and, and we know what it's like. Uh, moms especially know what this is like. Um, siblings, you can, might see younger, your younger siblings, uh, and you know what this is like. Like a babe longs for milk, that's how we ought, that's the comparison of how we ought to long for the word. There should be an insatiable appetite. And like every single ground for assurance of this list of five, every single one of these, we do not want to make these grounds of assurance the object of of our faith. So parents, and this is a little easier to explain to the parents, we don't want to come to this passage and say, look to your appetite 
and trust in your appetite for the Word of God to find assurance. Just like every other ground of assurance, we're talking about subjective grounds, the, the marks that need to be produced in my life to prove that my faith is real. What's, what's the object of my faith? Christ. Christ. Christ's person, his work on the cross, his atonement against the Father for my sins, for my guilt, my trust had better be exclusively in Christ. And so when we start looking at these grounds of assurance, sometimes it's going to be quite easy. And this is, this is probably true in my experience. It's more true of children growing up in Christians' homes where true, the true nature of saving faith is understood that our children are probably going to be more prone to struggle with thinking that I'm going to see these things and I start to put my trust in these things. And then you'll probably start to hear your children ask questions like, I, I want to believe, but I don't think my faith is strong enough. I want to believe, but I haven't killed enough sin. I want to believe, but my appetite for the word is not enough. And guess what? That's an opportunity to just be transparent with your kids and say, yeah, me neither. <laughs> me neither. You know what, son? My appetite for the word has never been enough to merit heaven. You know what, son? I have never killed sin successfully enough that God was just so impressed with me. The question is, am I trusting Christ exclusively how I can know is some of these things are going to be produced in my life in a way that becomes encouraging that my faith actually is in Christ. So if my faith starts to slip off of Christ and I start trusting in my appetite for the word, guess what? My assurance is as roller coaster, as unstable as my appetite for the word. And my appetite for the word is not, it's, it's totally fallible. It is not what it ought to be. The only way I can have assurance is my faith is exclusively in Christ. And when it's in Christ, it's going to produce an appetite for his word. And so that's when you, when you articulate this to, to, our, to our, our, our children, it's just important to keep that in mind. Longing for the word is a natural outflow of having experienced salvation, but it is not, like all these other grounds, it's not the object of our faith. It's a grounds that we would have assurance that our faith in Christ is real and legitimate. Okay, so now... Look at verse 2 again. Long for the pure milk of the word, and then it gives into a purpose statement, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. That's the goal here. The goal is that we can grow in respect to our salvation. There's no growth in salvation apart from an appetite for the word. This is a very fundamental mark and ground of assurance. Because when this starts to wane, and when we start to see an appetite diminish, it's going to affect our ability to see all of the other grounds of assurance come to fruition in our lives. Um, everything's going to flow out of this. It comes out of an appetite, a longing. Remember Psalm 1, verse 2? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The meditation on God's word, the, the chewing it up, the considering its implications, the seeing how it connects to the areas of my own heart, that flows out of a delight in God's word. It's a love for God's word. And so... This growth in respect to salvation flows out of the appetite. Now, we get to verse 3, and it's this interesting conditional phrase. If you've tasted the kindness of the Lord. If. Okay, that's a conditional clause. And what's fascinating about this conditional clause is Peter's, Peter's saying it in such a way. It's, it's, like, it's like he says, hey, if you've actually tasted the kindness of the Lord. If you've actually experienced, and the taste is an experiential um, taste. Uh, he's quoting from Psalm 34 here. And so he's saying, if you've tasted his kindness, if you've tasted his goodness, if you've experienced how kind God is to his children by way of forgiveness, by way of adoption, by way of regeneration, well, then it's just natural and logical that the outflow of that kind of experience would be an appetite for his word. And so in light of that condition, you can say, that's really the test of whether I've experienced salvation is some sort of appetite. A few years ago, uh, my wife and I were on a layover um, in uh, Belgium, and we, we, we went over to, we were, we were trying to drive from, from um, Brussels up to uh, Antwerp, and we stopped in Liege. Uh, we went, kind of went out of our way, because we, we stopped in Liege and uh, found this bakery, 
that was supposed to be like the best bakery in all of Belgium. And Liege kind of takes pride in their own special waffle. So there's the Belgian waffle. Yeah. Then there's the Liege waffle. And so we went over there to see how, how good is this Liege waffle. And we went and there's this, this uh, you know, ranked number one or whatever on some travel, trip, trip advisor or Travelocity, whatever. And so we find this bakery and it's like they bought, they, they, they're so busy that they bought a storefront on both sides of this street. So there's foot traffic going up and down the hill on each side of the street going into the separate bakeries. And then they, um, they sell right there and just, it just, it's, it's just mad busy. And so we go in there and we, we buy a bunch of these, these items and it's just, you know, incredible. The dirt cheap and everybody's just buying their, their normal bakeries. And we're, we're buying like waffles and cinnamon rolls and everything else and just, you know, getting loaded up. And we walked out of there and we got to the corner. We're waiting at this stop walk and we start eating this waffle. And it was like one of those moments where we just, we just stopped. We let the traffic go and we're just sitting there enjoying this waffle thinking, we're about to leave the best bakery in the world. Like, what are we doing? Let's go back in there and buy everything they've got. We'll freeze dry it, put it in our luggage and bring it home. I mean, we were just like, it was like so good. It was so good. It was just to the point that we actually had a conversation with one of the guys who worked there about, you know, the kind of sugar that you use and the kind of dough and the, the way that they, it rises and then the way that they bake it. And so then we're like, okay, we got we to gotta buy like an industrial size uh, suitcase full of uh, pearl sugar and we're going to replicate this at home. I mean, it's just like, if you have tasted a liege waffle, you know. And if you have had a liege waffle, no, I'm just kidding. If you, if you don't like liege waffles, that's who cares. That's not, the, that's not the point. But in my mind, it was just something that was so good that I thought, well, surely anybody who's had one of these things is going to think, oh, that's amazing. You, you, you've, you've got to have one. You need to have one. You want one. And any opportunity you'd have to have it, you would do whatever it takes to get it. And I thought, you know, that's kind of what Peter's getting at here. If you've tasted the kindness of the Lord long, have the appetite. This, um, this experience of God's goodness and this experience of God's kindness is the, is the cause of this hunger. And sometimes when we see our appetite rise and fall, that's a good indicator. Of, hey, something's not, all's not well in our heart and our soul. And um, sin needs to be put off. We need to acknowledge our need. We need to ask God for grace to increase our appetite. Um, all of that's part of the appetite. And the question is not, the question for our children is never, it's not, it's not the question for us either, is it? It's not, is my appetite, has it reached a level that correlates to the value of God's word? No, that's not the question. Is my appetite what it ought to be? No, that's not the question. The question is, do I long for it? Is there an appetite for the word? And somebody who says that they've tasted God's kindness, but they have no appetite for his word, well, that would be suspect. And that's where it can be helpful for a soul to think, hmm, have I tasted God's kindness? And why is there no appetite? Don't be self-righteous towards your kids. And instead, just acknowledge that your appetite's not what it ought to be all the time and explain to them that the desire you have for God's word is a result of his grace and his kindness to you. And then you can even show them from this passage how to uh, deal with either a, a lack of appetite or a waning appetite um, from, from his word. So number one is killing sin. Number two, hungering for the word. Number three, obeying God. Obeying God. Now this one, I'm going to look at two passages, and they're both in 1 John. So turn over to 1 John, and we're going to look at chapters 3 and 5. And there's so many places we can go. Admittedly, there's, there's just so many places that talk about this. This is a critical one. Probably, but by way of survey of the number of passages that talk about this ground of enjoying assurance, this is probably the most common in the scriptures. In 1 John 3, we come into an important text, and it's helpful for adults, it's helpful for children, thinking through assurance, and it's a text that has been very, very unfortunately misunderstood. In 1777, John Wesley wrote a book called A Plain Account of Christian Perfectionism. It's, a, it's just a sad waste of paper that has harmed many souls in tragic ways. The confusion in this book comes from this passage. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 to 10, John Wesley takes this passage and basically explains that if you are a Christian Christian, 
you don't sin anymore. And um, that's, got a, that's got some major, major, major problems with this paragraph. And it has some major, major problems with the epistle at large because he says in chapter 1, if you say that you're without sin, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. And so that would make him a liar, at least he was a liar in 1777. What's important about this passage is recognizing what John does say is true of a believer. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now notice this word practice. To practice sin or to practice lawlessness, it's the same verb. And this verb starts to show up um, all over the place in this, in this passage. In, in verses, it shows up in verse 7, in verse 8, verse 9, and in verse 10. And so it's important to recognize that this word to it's translated practice. It means to practice or perform, to produce, to make, to even manufacture. And so it's describing this productivity. It's describing a performance. It's describing a production. It's what's, what's being produced by one's life? What's being manufactured by one's life? And the production of your life is going to be the overflow of your heart. Um, out of the overflow of the heart, you produce, <laughs> you practice either sin or lawlessness. In verse 5, he says, you know that he appeared to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. Verse 6, no one who abides in him sins, and no one who sins has seen him or knows him. And that's the verse. Verse 6 is probably where um, Wesley's going to try, to try to get the most traction to say that you don't sin at all. And what he's missing out on is, first of all, the word abide means you're remaining in him. You are continuing in him. You dwell in Christ. And somebody who dwells in Christ doesn't sin, verse 6, in a, in a present tense sense. And there's really no debate. There's no legitimate debate about this in the, in the Greek language. There's a lot of debate about Greek, the Greek verbal system. There's no debate here. The present tense verb is an ongoing action. It's an ongoing aspect. This is what would characterize one's life. So it's very synonymous with what John just said in verse 4 about practicing sin or practicing lawlessness. It's the ongoing habitual production of one's life. In verse 6, if you're abiding in Christ, your life is not going to be characterized by this practice of sin, a regular performance of sin. He's not saying that no one who abides in him has sinned, past tense, or commits a sin, present tense. It's sins in an ongoing aspect of practice. And no one who sins has seen him or knows him. And so that becomes an incredible test. Somebody can say, I abide in Christ, and their life could be characterized by sin, and that would disprove their profession. So they don't have assurance. They don't have any grounds. They don't have any biblical grounds to assurance. If you make a profession to love Christ and to be in Christ, but your life is characterized by, by sin and rebellion, your profession is, is null and void. Your assurance, you have no grounds to that assurance. Verse 7 now, he goes back to the term practice. Notice what he says. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Now those two verses are incredibly important because you have... Um, People who practice righteousness, verse 4, and practice lawlessness, verse 4b. And then in 7 and 8, he picks that up and says, so there's a person who's practicing righteousness. Well, that, that's a person who is in Christ. And the person who practices sin, 4b, he picks that back up in verse 8 and says, well, that person's of the devil. So they're actually doing this. They're enslaved to the devil. The, Lord, the, the God of this world is governing their life. And so you can read about that in John 3, 19 to 21. You can read about that in 2, Peter, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. Verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin. And again, the word is practice, perform, produce, manufacture. Again, present tense. I mean, he's very consistent in the grammar throughout this, this whole paragraph. No one who, and, 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 and I, do wish, I do wish the NES had gone with their, their marginal note here, begotten. No one who is born of God, no one who has been begotten of God, no one who has already been regenerated, currently, perpetually, practices sin. 
because God's seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. And so that becomes very, very helpful. Do we practice righteousness? Do we obey God? Are we marked by a yieldedness? If you claim to love God, but you don't obey him, then you're a liar, according to John 14, 15. And if you claim to be perfect, you're a liar, according to 1 John 1, verses 8 and 10. Now, the question we want to help our our children with is, what is this obedience like? What's it it like? Uh, It's going to be helpful um, to just point out the, 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 the value and the benefit of obedience to parents. That's going to be the first and foremost sign and place and location where obedience can be proven is obedience to parents. Um, Because God's commanded, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And Colossians 3 says, obey your parents. This is well-pleasing to the Lord. It pleases God when children come under the authority of their parents. And so that's 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 valuable, it's beneficial, and it's a blessing. Regardless of where they're at spiritually, that's that's always a blessing. At the same time, I also want to say that it's important to, to even help, uh, help our, our children think through, you know, there could be even other motives for obedience that we would want to be aware of. And I'm going to turn to 1 John 5 to help with this one. 1 John 5 is helpful for us as parents trying to talk this through with our children because we don't want to, we don't want to tax our children or exasperate them by, by giving them some sort of standard that they can't understand. And, uh, you know, that would just be miserable. But we also don't want to give assurance where, you know, some, some of our children might just be motivated by, you know what, I, I love my life and I love my comfort and it just goes easier for me when I obey my parents and I'm going to do that because it's just, I love myself. And we wouldn't, the last thing you want to do is say, yeah, see, this, this fulfills that. First John 5 is, is a helpful passage in this, in this light. And, and particularly probably even for your teenagers to walking, walking through this text. Let's pick it up in verse, let's just look at verses 1 through 3. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. Now again, the footnote is excels in the NES. And um, it's a perfect tense verb that's translated is born of God. And so it's literally has been begotten of God. The believe verb is present tense. So whoever presently, currently, in an ongoing fashion is believing that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God already. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. And so the question now becomes, what does faith in Christ look like? And what does love for the father look like? And that's where he goes, particularly the love of the father. He picks that up in verses two and three. By this, we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and observe his commandments. So if you love God, you love his child, right? He's, he's already dealt with that in chapter 4. And so love for God looks like love for a Christian. And he even says, by this you know that you love the child of God when you love God and obey his commandments. So he turns it right back on its, on its head and says, there's nothing more loving for a brother in Christ than to love God and obey his commandments. Okay, so now the issue is still obedience, obeying God's commandments. That's an important test. That's an important grounds of of assurance. Is my life marked by obedience? Now, verse 3 helps us to even see something very, very important about this this obedience. Verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. We guard them, we protect them, we observe them, we submit to them. And his commandments are not burdensome. Okay, that's a helpful description of the kind of uh, obedience that John is talking about. Are our obedience, is our obedience to his commands a burden or not? Well, let's just uh, think about this for a second. Is obedience easy? No, it's not easy. It's hard. But is it a burden? See, see, difficulty and burden are different words. It's different. And it's helpful for our children. It can be very discouraging for our children if, um, 
to whatever degree they can perceive our life, and we've walked with Christ, you know, longer than them, some of us decades longer than them, and, and um, they look at our life and say, oh man, mom and dad just have it together, and phew, it's, just, it's just easy for mom and dad. And it's helpful for a child to know, no, obedience isn't easy. But if it's a burden, we're, we're going to lack the grounds of assurance that we need. Think about this. In Mark 10, verse 27, Jesus says, With people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So as far as difficulty, obedience is something that's beyond our ability. So, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it requires us to get outside of ourselves, to walk by faith, to confess sin, to yield our will, to step forward in faith into a command that we don't have natural ability for and trust that the Lord will sustain us as we pursue obedience. It's difficult. But if yielding our will to God's will is begrudging, if it's a frustration, if it's a burden, I wish I didn't have to do this, that tells us a lot about our obedience. And I think verse 3 is very, very helpful. You know, help. you can ask your, you ask your kids, do I obey my parents? And you can ask them, you have to repeat yourself, and you're helping them understand the nature of obedience. That's a, that's a normal part of parenting. It's a normal part of child growing up to understand what God's calling them to do and to be. And of course, true obedience, as the scriptures demand, are gonna, it's not going to produce a Pharisee. It's going to produce an awareness of the inability, and it's going to leave them looking to, to Christ in the, in the gospel. But you can ask your children, simply put, is obedience a burden? In other words, that starts to help our children understand that, you know what, if I'm doing this and I'm doing it, like, it's kind of begrudging, like, I really wish I didn't have to do this, but I kind of have to to get something else that I want. And that starts to expose that, you know what, my obedience might not be what it, what it ought to be. And it's helpful for you to acknowledge that obedience is hard for you and it's going to be hard for them. But they need to see, in believing parents, our children need to see that obedience is a privilege. No matter how difficult obedience is, because of circumstance and because of our flesh and because of all that goes into the Christian walk, that it is a privilege. Oh yeah, son, this is, this is hard stuff. But do you know what a privilege it is? To have clear commands from God so that we can serve him and we can walk in faith and we can live the way God wants us to live? Oh, this is such a privilege. Difficult? Yes. Burden? No. No. Where else would I want to be but in obedience to my Lord? And so the, uh, the burden element is very, very important. Is your obedience a burden? All right, these last two, I'm going to have to be very quick here. Number four is loving Christians. And number five is growing in godliness. Now, these two, I would admit, are probably, I put these two last, these two are probably going to be a little bit more helpful in some ways for our teenagers than for like your, your, your younger children. And not that, of course, you're going to teach these to your children. Um, you, you, you don't even teach all the scripture to your children. But as far as the um, practical application of these tests, it's going to be a little bit easier for a teenager to be able to apply these tests because of the time element involved. Um, and number four, loving Christians is also a challenge because then that, that there's an element of this quality of assurance that comes from seeing a love that is, is even prioritizes a love for Christians um, because of a love for God. The challenge with that for really young kids is they're trying to figure out, am I in Christ? And um, so then recognizing if the neighbor's in Christ is even more, that's, like, that's a whole different, uh, different issue. So that becomes very, very challenging. So this is probably going to be a little bit more applicable to your teenagers, quite honestly. Um, but on, on loving Christians, let's pick it up in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Remember in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. One of the tests that you have already been regenerated, one of the tests that you already know God, is that you love the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So if you don't love, then you don't know the God who is love. Now, skip down to verse 19. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. 
For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should also love his brother. Now that's a great test for our kids, because you know what that looks like, right? It's so easy for somebody to say, hey, I love God. But then when it comes to loving the brother, and now there's a real cost involved. Suddenly, and as we know from, as adults in the church, you know, loving somebody who is hard to deal with, or who has bad breath, or <laughs> who calls you in the middle of the night, or has a need that's going to cost you Uh, time or resource or whatever, suddenly that's a real proving grounds of, do I actually love God? Because if I love God, then I'd love my brother. And now there's a real cost involved. There's a real test here. There's something really tangible um, about a love for a saint. Oh yeah, I love God. Love God. What's it look like? Well, he's invisible. He knows I love him. Okay, well the proof is that you would love all of his spiritual children because you have the same spiritual DNA. And with all the costs and all the challenge and all the difficulty that goes into that, wow, now you can see a real love for God and love for Christians, love for people who, when it, when it doesn't serve you well, when it's not easy for you. What's helpful for, uh, with our children is, I would, help your, I would encourage your children to think through the difference between forms of self-love that fuel horizontal relationships versus the love for God that would fuel that. And that can be challenging at times, but we've had conversations that, you know what, guys, sometimes we like people because we like the same things. We like Legos or horses or sports or whatever. And so sometimes those kind of things can fuel our relationships. And those things aren't wrong, but that's different than love for the brethren. Sometimes we want to spend time with people because they have something we like, a new toy, a new game, whatever. But love for a brother or sister in Christ is love for those who have the same spiritual father, and so we have the same spiritual DNA. And so I admit, this is a difficult one. It's, it's important and it's challenging for our younger children, um, but it still is a fundamental ground of assurance. And um, so in light of the fact that our children are asking this question, am I in Christ? And they're trying to learn that. The, 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 the practicality of this one is going to probably take some time. For our teenagers, it becomes very, very helpful to have to think through what's motivating my horizontal relationships with my friends in the church. Do I love those relationships because of how it pleases Christ and because it can be a spiritual benefit to a brother or a sister in Christ? Number five, growing in godliness. So let me just list them for you here. I think it's, yeah, it's on the screen there. Killing sin hungering for the word, obeying God, loving Christians, and then number five, growing in godliness. And again, this one has a time element, and so it's going to be very helpful for um, um, our students who have been in Christ and are, are asking this question. They can look back at the, in the rearview mirror of their life for the last year or two and say, what's going on? How do I read this? Second Peter chapter 1 gives us a test that involves a current possession of godliness and an increase in godliness. And both of those marks are really important to this, t- this text. Um, to, make this, to, keep, to make sure we finish on time here, let me just kind of give you a quick, quick overview here. Um, basically, I would encourage you to spend time in verses 1 through 11 asking the question, what does this text say about assurance? It says a lot more than assurance, but it says a lot about assurance as well. The reason why I say that is verse 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord. And so he's talking about this increase of grace and peace. So grace and peace are not static. They're actually being multiplied. They're actually increasing in the life of a Christian. And so he wants that to increase. And he's praying that it would increase to the recipients of this letter. Now, when you skip down to verse um, 10, it says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. What an incredible verse. This verse is explaining that I want you to be super diligent. I don't want you to spare any effort. Don't spare any effort. There's no effort that's too, too much to ask to make sure and certain that God's effectual call and his sovereign election Landed on you. That's an incredible verse. He wants us to know that. And so this is a a profound passage about assurance. 
And what is this test? And I've labeled it growing in godliness. And the reason why is because of what he says, particularly in verses 5 through 11. In verse 5, he says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence, don't spare any effort, in your faith, supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, knowledge. In your knowledge, self-control. In your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. In your godliness, brotherly kindness. In your brotherly kindness, love. He lists through eight virtues. And there should be eight virtues that we would be able to see in our life. And he's asking us to add to them, to supply more to them. Notice in verse 8, if these qualities are yours, so that means that there's a possession, and if they are increasing. So there's a possession of these virtues and an increase of these virtues. They will render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never be useless. You'll never be unfruitful if you possess these qualities and if they're increasing. That's a very, very helpful passage because one of the takeaways we can, we can help our kids with is just to say, if, if they've been professing Christ for some time, then you could just point to this passage and say, you know, this is great, son or, or daughter, you know, you just, whoever you're speaking to, you just say, hey, this is great. Because now, you know what this passage shows us is, are these things mine? Are they in my life? Not, not, not that I've mastered them, not that I've arrived, just are they there? And maybe a helpful way to word it would be, you know, it's kind of like when you're driving down the road and you, you, know, you see mom and dad driving, we've got the rear view mirror, you can kind of see where you've been, you can see what's behind you. Well, when you look back at your life, um, you know, do you, do you see that this has been growing? So for somebody who's been in Christ 10 years, you can look back at the last decade and say, is my faith, has it grown from what it was? Has my self-control grown from what it was? Has my perseverance grown from what it was? And somebody who's been in Christ for two years, you can say, do you have these qualities? And have they grown over the last two years? And what an incredible encouragement that is, because that's going to render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that way, as you diligently see growth in godly character, you will make certain about his calling and choosing you. Because as long as you practice these things, verse 10 says, you will never stumble. Verse 11, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. What does that mean for an entrance to be abundantly supplied to you? You're either in or you're not. But this abundant supplying of the entrance seems like the doors are just wide open. God just welcomes you in and says, of course you're mine. You made sure of your calling and your election. There was an increase of godliness throughout your walk with me. And, and you were never useless nor unfruitful because what the grace that I was giving you was growing and becoming exponentially more powerful, more fruitful in your life. Come on in. And this is abundant, abundant doors open wide welcoming into the kingdom. And so that's a, that's a ground of assurance. That's how you make certain of your calling and your election. And you can know that you are in Christ if you see growth in godliness in these eight qualities. Now, we've got a few minutes left, and I just want to say, I want to give you some encouragement to think about this, and this is for the parents particularly. Um, how do we apply this? As we think about um, helping our kids think through some of these um, grounds of assurance and helping them understand biblical assurance, you know, we're going to have to answer questions, especially, you know, when, when, when communion happens and when there's baptism and we think about church membership and we think about all of these dynamics, how do we think that through with our, with our children? And, and, and I do want to just re- say what I, uh, repeat what I said at the beginning. Make sure, I would encourage you to really make sure that you try to avoid giving your opinion and make sure that you continue to go back to Scripture when your kids are asking just generally about assurance. And, um, um, you know, ultimately it doesn't matter what Dad thinks, right? What matters is what God thinks, so we keep going back to the Scriptures. And then the same is true, then, when we start thinking about more practical questions, like if your child's asking you, hey, what about Lord's Supper? Uh, what about baptism? And so here's how we, I want to encourage you to, to think about these things. Um, you know, when it comes to church Membership and baptism, we've talked about this before in some of the 
at least in our last um, baptism service, there's, a, there's a, a, a really sweet line that's drawn between church, bat, between church membership and baptism, and then there's a sweet line that's drawn between baptism and, and church membership with church discipline as well. And um, I won't belabor this, but if you go back and you read Acts chapter 2, the response to the gospel is repent and believe and be separated from a perverse culture. And they separate themselves from the world, join themselves to the church. They're immediately numbered. And so you say, what's this church membership term? Okay, forget about church membership. Uh, the biblical term is being numbered among the saints. And they, they keep track of who's there. They know who's in. They know who's out. People are separating themselves from a perverse culture. They're joining the church, and they're baptized, and they say, I'm following Christ, and this is my family. And that's a faithful response to the gospel. And so there's, there's, a, there's a helpful connection there. And so I would just encourage parents to think about that connection. Think, think very soberly about that connection. When we um, talk about you know, baptism and, and church membership, those things are, are helpfully connected in the scriptures. Um, and, and I would say this, that you know, if you think about this, and I, and I think families are probably going to make this, the, this decision in different ways, and that's, that's fine. Um, but I, I would encourage you to consider, you know, if, like, for instance, just to pick, a, pick a, 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 an age at random here, like a 13-year-old, um, if, thir- if your 13-year-old is, is saying, hey, I, I believe that I'm in Christ, and, and, um, and you're, you're trying to encourage him to think that through biblically, and you just don't want, you want him to, be, to have the biblical criteria for thinking that through, that becomes a help and an aid to his conscience as he continues to grow older. Um, but... You know, if you're, if you're feeling this compulsion, hey, he needs to be baptized because he needs to obey the Lord. That's, that's absolutely, we need to obey the Lord. Uh, but I would also just consider, consider the implications of what that would mean for a 13-year-old. Um, you, you shouldn't feel that uh, not having some sort of official membership status for a 13-year-old somehow means that they're going to miss out on anything in the church, right? Their participation in the church by virtue of being in your family is going to continue, they're included. They, uh, they're included in the equipping ministries. They have access to teaching, to discipleship, to the loving um, ministry of the body of Christ to their lives. Um, they're, they're going to have, be there personally present. They're going to have opportunity to serve, to use their gifting. And really, there's not any spiritual blessing that would be lost if they became a member later as an, as an adult making that decision on their own. Nothing's really lost by way of their equipping. So I'm not saying that that would be wrong for a teenager to be baptized. That's not wrong. But just to consider that nothing's lost by way of the benefit of the church body to a believer who's, you know, who's been regenerated at a, at a younger age. Now, when, it, when, when we... Um, you know, if our children become adults, and at that point they're hesitant to become a member of a biblical sound uh, local church, then something might be lost, and we might be wanting to press in and figure out why. Um, but nothing would be lost for the younger person who, who is not um, necessarily a member. But here's, here's kind of the, maybe a, uh, something to consider as parents, and this is something that uh, the, the elders here and pastors here have, have uh, encouraged us to think through as parents. And that would be to consider what it would be like for a, a young 13-year-old, maybe, to, to make this adult-level decision. You know, if, if, a, if, a, if, a, if an individual becomes a member of the church and, and says, yep, I'm, I'm, I have forsaken the world and I'm joining myself to the church and I want the accountability of the church, that's great. And, and they should want that accountability. Um, but consider, consider that this is a, really an adult-level decision with adult-level responsibility um, to be asking for public accountability for one's profession. And um, it could be very challenging. It's not impossible. In fact, I can, I can actually dis- I can think of one scenario where I can think of a teenager whose testing was so legitimate um, that I had no concerns about baptism or membership or whatever. But it can be very challenging, can't it? And as, as parents raising children in a Christian home where they're testing, really, they haven't really been tested by the forces of the world in the ways that they will be. And they haven't necessarily even seen industrial strength desires. And, and, and some of these things that are, uh, are still future uh, haven't yet happened. Um, I, I, would, I would caution you just to consider very soberly uh, what it would be like to encourage, like, like for instance, our hypothetical 13-year-old, to make a decision with that level of accountability uh, before that kind of testing has, has happened. Um. What about the Lord's Supper? Uh, 
the Lord's Supper. Again, parents are going to no doubt probably um, apply this differently and come to different decisions on this. Um, and that's great. Um, but I would encourage you to consider um, that obviously if, if you encourage your child to partake in the Lord's Supper and they're not professing, that would be a parenting fail. Uh, but in these other applications, uh, how do I apply this? If, our, if my child is professing Christ and seems like there's fruit, but it's not really tested, um, people are probably going to make uh, different decisions there. But I would encourage you to consider, just, just by way of uh, encouragement, I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 11 and pay attention to the language that Paul uses there, um, talking about judgment, judgment on the body by take, partaking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Because there is a corporate element to the Lord's Supper, and that's, that's why every week when we have the Lord's Supper, you'll hear uh, a pastor, elder, fence the table. That's kind of a temp, that's like a historical term where we're saying, hey, this is for believers only. And so in light of that corporate nature of, of communion, it's important to just consider that and think about what it would mean to partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. It is a corporate element. And so some, some parents might prefer to kind of keep that line tight and connect. I think that's helpful at times. Um, between um, church membership and baptism as well as partaking of the Lord's Supper. But regardless of how you apply that, I stole this, I stole this out of Smed's playbook. We were talking about this last week, and he just said, you know, regardless of where you're at on where you're uh, on encouraging or dissuading your children from partaking of the Lord's Supper, those who are professing and who don't have fruit that would, you know, render that questionable, Regardless of where you ask and land on that, it was, it's just helpful to go ahead and begin training your children to think properly about communion as it's passed. So every week, you, you can help our, help our children think through the nature of their own personal sin. As, as, as the pastor's walking through that text, that passage, there's going to be something unique about God's glory and about the gospel in that passage. Uh, focus on that and then ask what does that trace, how does that trace back to my heart's sin? What does that mean about me personally? Uh, what does my sin deserve? And then start training them to think about God's provision for sin. So what does that mean about Christ's perfection and his suffering and, and how he was enough to pay for God's wrath against my sin? And what kind of gratitude and joy that, that I should experience as a sinner knowing that I would benefit from such a Savior as he and then, regardless if they're partaking or not, they're actually benefiting from um, the truth of the gospel. And so that would be a, I would definitely encourage that, um, regardless of, of where you land on practically uh, for those children who are uh, bearing fruit, um, what you do with them. So sorry that uh, I kind of had to wrap that up quickly, but uh, we need to, to end here. Let me uh, close in a word of prayer, and then we'll get ready for our morning service. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And again, thank you for the clarity of the word about where assurance comes from. And Lord, of course, what may not be clear at times is um, where uh, someone else might be. As parents, we, we long to know where our children are at spiritually, and I just pray that regardless if we know or if we don't know, that we would continue to be faithful to both evangelize and disciple our children. I pray that we would, be, we would trust you and trust your word, that we could leave them with you and continue to equip and love and model and uh, confess and forsake on our own, as well as help them to see what the scriptures might show about their own life. And so, Lord, um, as we're thinking about this assurance, number one, I just pray that everyone here would have appropriate clarity so that they would either have assurance because you've given it to them or that they wouldn't because you haven't. I pray that we would not be deceived by our own heart, by the opinion of others, by a fallible conscience, or looking for marks of what we think would be true of a Christian. Instead, Lord, I pray that we would get all of our, our grounds for assurance from you. Because when we look at inspired tests, like, a, like, like these passages that we've looked at, well, when these passages produce assurance because we see something in our hearts and our lives that match what you've said will be exclusively true of your children, <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for that grace. And um, I pray that for our children here, uh, the children in this church, I pray that they would grow in their understanding of assurance. And as they develop, I pray that that uh, clear understanding of biblical assurance would be an aid to them to have increasing clarity about where they stand with you. Use that clarity, use that conscience for their own growth, whether that's evangelism or discipleship, as they grow older and as they mature physically. 
And so, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. In your name we pray. Amen.